everybody. <laughs> Thank you for, for staying so late and for coming to speak. Um, as Mayor mentioned, uh, I'm a children's writer, and I thought I'd, I'd share with you a little bit about my journey and my goals in uh, creating literature for kids and, and hopefully changing the narrative for American Muslims uh, through through this media. And I won't talk at you too long because it's so late, but I'll, I'll just introduce myself quickly, um, share my work, and then hopefully we can have a conversation because I'd love to hear about what you all are thinking about these, these topics. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I am, I was born and raised in Maryland of Pakistani heritage. My parents immigrated from Pakistan before I was born. Of course, I was raised an American Muslim. I was a big reader for those those girls in the, in the audience. Um, I, was, I loved to read as a kid, and I also loved to write for fun. I spent a lot of time writing um, letters and poems. And, um, I actually had a family newspaper that I'll share with you in a moment. Uh, and I, as I mentioned, I, I spent a lot of time reading. I spent a lot of time at the library. My mom would take us every few weeks to the public library with shopping bags from the grocery store that she would, we would fill up with books. Uh, and these are some of the stories that I read growing up. Uh, for those of you who can see them, they all have female protagonists. They're all stories about siblings. They, each of these characters had one of their sisters. And you know, they're all very family centric. And I read everything. I read fantasy and science fiction and mystery. But these are the stories that I gravitated to the most and really connected with and read over and over again. And these are the characters that I still think about now, so many years later. But there was something missing in all of these stories that I was reading, and that was me. I never saw myself in any of the books that I wrote when I was growing up. I never encountered a Pakistani American child or a Muslim character in any of the books that I read, which was very typical at that time. Uh, and I also mentioned that I used to write for fun, and I had this family newspaper that I called The Chronicles, and I actually found issues of the paper that um, you know, yellowed notebook paper pages where I had stories that I wrote about my family. And it's interesting to go back all these years later and read these issues. And what, I, what was very striking to me was that in all of them, I, I don't mention anything about my culture, my religion, the food that made at home, the language we spoke, the Islamic education I was getting. If anyone was to pick up that paper and read, apart from the names that were mentioned, you would think that you were reading about any white American person non-Muslim. Uh, and I think that was reflected because I that was what I was reading. You know, and I don't think I felt like I had the license to write about those issues because I didn't think they were worth sharing or worth telling because no one else was writing these stories, so why would anybody want to read them? Uh, and you know, even though I wasn't aware of how much that lack of representation impacted me, now as an adult I can go back and see um, the impact that it had. And growing up as a Muslim in America, you know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, when I was a child in elementary school, I went through the public education system in Maryland, which was actually a very good system, a good county. Um, and at that time, growing up, as we know, for those of us who, who grew up in this country during that time, Islam was very little, very relatively unknown. Uh, we were pretty much under the radar, and there was very little understanding of our traditions and holidays. When I was in school, my teachers didn't even know what Ramadan was most, most of the time. When I was missing school because of the Eid holiday, I wouldn't even say that I'm missing school for Eid. I didn't use it by name. I would write the note that my parents would sign, and it would say, please excuse Hena for her religious holiday, because I didn't bother to refer to it by name. And I remember when I was a sophomore at high school, my teacher asked where my family was fun from, and when I said Pakistan, she said, oh, that's nice, where is that? Um, and this was in 10th grade. Um, and now looking back, you know, it's interesting, and maybe in a way it was a blessing to be invisible. But as a child, you want to be seen, you want to, you want people to understand you, and it, it hurts to be invisible, especially in your teacher's you know, eyes. Um, and I remember the first time being aware of Muslims in the media, and that was during the Iran hostage crisis, in 1978, between 78 and 80, when I was between 8 and 10 years old. And I remember even as a child, being as young as I was, you know, feeling that shame that these are my people doing these things that are getting all this negative attention. But at the same time, I think the difference was that 
as far as the country, even this image that I have up, it says deport all Iranians, right? It doesn't say all Muslims. And I feel like there was that distinction that it was political, it was a, a certain group of Muslims, they were the Iranians, and it wasn't, it didn't spread to all American Muslims. So I went on to, you know, from being seven or eight years old to uh, obviously growing up and working in, in public health communications, but I had the chance to start writing books for kids about 16 years ago, and these are some of the first books that I published that had nothing to do with Islam or being a Muslim. I wrote about space and spies and, and the Peanuts book, Guide to Growing Up. Um, but at the same time, I was very inspired by other books that I was finding because I was also a new mother at the time, and I was reading books to my kids and you know, taking my kids to the library and looking for those stories that I didn't have when I was a kid, and sadly, they still didn't exist. Um, I found books about Chinese-American families. I found books about Sammy Spider celebrating his first Hanukkah with a family. And I thought, where, you know, I was jealous when I saw these books and thought, where are the books for our community? Um, they just didn't exist. And at the same time, 9-11 had just happened. And of course, as we all know, we, we knew that the world would never be the same for American Muslims. Um, and at the time, you know, a lot of things were being said. There was a lot of confusion, a lot of curiosity all of a sudden. People wanted to know more about who we were as a community. And at the same time, somebody said, Islam is a vibrant faith. Millions of our fellow citizens are Muslim. We respect the faith. We honor its traditions. Our enemy does not. Our enemy doesn't follow the great traditions of Islam. They hijacked a great religion. Does anyone know who said that? Muhammad. That's right. George Bush. Yeah. Who would think that? We would now look back at him as like, be um, the dignified statesman that he now seems to be. But, you know, he, at the time, it was a great service, as we know, to our community that he did make that distinction very clearly. Um, I know he, he went on to say something um, about Islam being a religion of peace and about all, I think he said something like, all, um, ours is a country based upon tolerance and we welcome people of all faiths in America. And he said that at another event. And he made it very clear that American Muslims were not the enemy, that we were welcome, etc. And we know that's not the case today. Um, so all this was happening, and there was all this curiosity about who Muslims were, and I wanted to create something to help change that. Um, so I started thinking about audience. I wanted to reach schools and libraries, and, and especially public schools that really had very little resources. I wanted Muslim kids to have what they call in the industry a mirror book, where they pick up a book and see themselves reflected. And I also wanted window books, which are for non-Muslim people, to be able to look in and see and understand our culture and our traditions. And the, the beauty of picture books and children's books in general are that you really reach more than just the children who are reading them. You're reaching parents who are reading to their children and with their children. You're reaching educators, librarians, and so it has this ripple effect into the community. This is the first book I published that came out in 2008 called Night of the Moon. It's a simple book about Yasmin and her family celebrating the month of Ramadan. They're watching the, the moon change shape over the, the month and they celebrate Eid and Yasmin gets a special surprise. Spoiler, it's a telescope to help her watch for Ramadan. And I wove in things like the lunar cycle and the change in shape of the moon so that teachers could use that in addition to learning about Ramadan. They could also do lesson on the, the, the lunar cycle. And this is an interior page of the book. A few years later, I published Golden Jones and Silver Lanterns. And this book is about a Muslim book of colors, which is very simple, written in verse. It's not holiday specific, although I do mention Ramadan and Eid in it. And in this book, people can learn about objects and themes that are special to Muslims through, through color. And a couple examples are blue is the hijab mom likes to wear, it's a scarf she uses to cover her hair. So very simple verse. Um, black is the ink I use to draw the Arabic letters that spell Allah. And you know, I go on to introduce the Quran and the prayer rug and the kufi and the very simple um, concepts and objects. I also wrote other books that had nothing to do with Islam, uh, like about Mars and Amazon. But the reason I mention this is that I tried to include diverse characters in every book that I could, because apart from books about Muslims, it's also important for Muslim characters to appear in, appear in books about anything. So in this book about um, the Amazon, I included an Egyptian doctor named Hania Suleiman as one of the characters. And in my book about Mars, there's an astronaut from uh, India named Anissa Malik. So I think that's another important um, tool to you know, increase people's awareness of Muslims. 
And then last year, as many of you know, I was thrilled when I when I wrote It's More About Curious George. Um, people wonder, how did that happen? How did you write Curious George? And the publisher actually approached me, knowing that I had published those other books that I just showed you about those things. And they asked me if they thought, if I thought the Muslim community would be open and interested in having Curious George celebrate Ramadan. And of course, growing up as I did, and knowing how much I would have loved a book like this when I was growing up, um, I said with confidence that I thought the Muslim community would be overjoyed, and, and they were. And the book got a lot of attention in the media, because I think people were, at this time, so excited to see something positive happening with Muslims attached to it. Because sadly, when the book came out last year, the election cycle was in full swing. Uh, we knew the damaging rhetoric that was you know, being said about Muslims, and the mood was very, very different from what it had been when under the Bush administration and, and of course, under Obama. So this book is a very simple book about Curious George celebrating Ramadan with his friends, and it focuses on community and family and charity, like, like most of my books do. And, um, and he gets into a little monkey trouble, like usual. And this is the scene where they're having dinner after after iftar and uh, celebrating the chocolate covered bananas. But as we know, as I mentioned, like, you know, building an Islam phobia, we know, is, is alive and well and growing in this country, sadly. And there was actually a new study that came out from ISPU, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, that was reported on NPR uh, a few weeks ago, and citing that 42% of Muslim children in America are, being, are reporting being in discrimination in school. And of that, I think almost a quarter of it, I, I might be wrong on that number, but a high percentage of that was actually from their teachers, so not even just their peers. And we know that you know, anti-Muslim violence and vandalism has skyrocketed. I think five mosques that burned to the ground this year alone, which is terrifying. Um, you know, back in 2015, there were 70, 78 reported incidents of mosques being uh, targeted in some way. And we know that, you know, just anecdotally, if you're just watching the news, that was, you know, probably double or quadrupled in 2016. And at the same time, that all, all of this is happening, it blows my mind that 60% of Americans still say they don't know a Muslim person, which I find hard to believe, and I think maybe they, maybe they don't know they know Muslim, you know, maybe they imagine a Muslim to look a certain way or act a certain way, and if you're not from the Middle Eastern or you're not wearing a scarf, or, you know, that, that you're not Muslim. Um, but that's what they think. And I think, obviously, with that, we know that when people don't know something, and it's, you know, they don't understand something, then it's easy for them to be misled. Right, by what they're hearing in the media, by what the Islamic folks are putting out there very aggressively. Um, and that's where I think the power of storytelling is, is so important because we can refute um, we can refute facts and we can argue back and forth as much as we want, right? About whether Islam is a religion of peace, whether you know terrorists are Muslim, whatever the issue is, but we can't no one can deny our stories. And if we give them an opportunity to get to know us, especially those who say they don't know us through our stories. Um, hopefully that creates you know, compassion and, and tolerance where maybe it isn't, um, and changes people's hearts and minds. And as I mentioned, for the for the kids out there, representation really matters, and I think now more than ever. Um, so I was really, really thrilled when Amina's Voice was published just a couple of months ago. And as Munir mentioned, it's the first publication of a new imprint called Salon Reads, uh, which is um, put out by Simon Schuster, which is one of the major publishers, and it kind of sort of a sub, a sub uh, division within a, a large publisher, and they specialize in different types of books. So they dedicated an entire imprint to books about this, so that we can tell our own stories. And they're recognizing, and the industry at large is really recognizing that these stories are important, that they need to be told, that they, they aren't being told, that most of children aren't seeing themselves like they're about it. And um, although it's slowly, slowly changing, it, it hasn't changed enough. Um, so it's looking out in March, and it's about a 12-year-old girl named Amna, who is a sixth grader. She's a Pakistani American, like, like me. Um, her parents are immigrants. Um, she's starting middle school for the first time. And I tried to create a character who's really relatable, that you know, any little girl, just like the books that I shared earlier that I read, that really I, I didn't see myself in, but I had stuff in common with those girls. Um, same, same way, I want anybody who picks up this book to feel like they can identify with Alna um, or have something in common with her. Um, she has a best friend who's Korean-American named Su Jin, 
And she's a very talented singer and has a beautiful singing voice, but she's extremely shy uh, and afraid to show it. Uh, in the story, she's dealing with her friends changing. I feel like that's something most uh, middle school age children deal with, is who are my friends and where do I fit in. Uh, her best friend is all of a sudden becoming friendly with a girl who wasn't very nice to them in the past, and that's making her confused. Her older brother, Mustafa, is rebelling a little bit at home, which is causing some tension. Her uncle's visiting from Pakistan, who is much more conservative than her family, and is sort of a father figure to her father, and that's making her parents feel pressure to impress him. There's a grand competition that her parents want her to compete in, and she, as I mentioned before, very stage shy, but she also would love to have the confidence to sing, but doesn't. And I introduced the idea that even though it, it introduces some controversy it's in the larger context of music and whether or not music is encouraged or not even encouraged but discouraged or forbidden in Islam. And and I did that purposefully because it's a in my mind a smaller issue obviously than terrorism or something like that. But a way to demonstrate that Muslims are not a monolith, right? We don't all live and practice the exact same way. And that there, there are disagreements even within families on how we choose to practice. Um, and that that idea is introduced in a, in a subtle way um, that obviously can make people understand that that translates into bigger issues as well. So during the story, uh, throughout the course of the story, um, that changes. Um, of course, as a writer, you want a character who grows and evolves and transforms into something else, or it's really not a satisfying story. So Amina learns the strength of her community. Um, the love of her family, who her friends really are, uh, the power inside of her to make a difference, and, and she really gains some confidence. Uh, and I'm hoping that readers gain insight into an American Muslim community because the book takes you into a mosque. Um, you meet the imam. You go to her Sunday school. You, you get to you get a glimpse into prayer and congregation things that a lot of Americans don't have access to. They they don't understand what really happens at a mosque. And are mosques really breeding grounds for terrorists or not? You know, is it creeping Sharia happening or whatever creeping Sharia is? Right? They, they think these things. So they don't know what an imam does. And so to see the imam in the story, you know, joking around with the kids and, and being an example to them and arranging this competition and encouraging them to compete, etc. Like that's just very humanizing and normalizing of what our communities look like. Um, you get a taste of Pakistani culture, lots of food. People say not to read this book on an empty stomach because they make you hungry, and you realize I this food the food obsessive I am. Um, but again, like the idea that we want compassion and understanding for for our community, and in the book, even though I wrote it four and a half years ago, the first draft that's how long it took for it to actually be published. Um, I I introduced the idea of mosque vandalism and the community that you get to know and love with Amina and her family is, is attacked. And when I wrote the book, um, I was on the board of ISP, the organization that I mentioned that did the study on, on bullying. And you know, I was aware of incidents that were happening around the country and I was very concerned about it. And I thought it was a way for people to understand from you know within from a girl who played character who they've come to appreciate from her perspective how damaging that is and what it would feel like to have to be this you know victim of an attack like that. And it's unfortunate now that people are pointing to this book and, and saying how timely and how relevant it is. And it's a really unfortunate coincidence because I, I wish it wasn't. And I wish that you know, it was something that happened and doesn't happen anymore. But sadly, it's the opposite. Um, and I set the book in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, even though I'm in Maryland and I'm outside of DC, right out in a DC suburb. And I didn't imagine that this could happen in my hometown being as diverse as it is, being as tolerant of a community as it is. And my husband grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, so I knew that community through his family, and I also knew that it was the site of a terrible attack on the Sikh temple some years ago, I don't know if you remember hearing about that, where six people were killed. Um, so I, that's why I chose that as the setting. And sadly, two weeks before this book came out, my local mosque received threats along with many around the country, um, and we know that the climate is, is, not, is not very friendly. Um, these are just some other titles about Muslims, um, you know, to demonstrate the variety that's out there. But what, what these books and my books and other books really need is the support of the community, 
um, we have to show the publishing industry that making an investment in something like Salon Reads was worth it to them. Because if not, they won't they won't keep doing it, right? At the at the end of the day, it's it's dollars and cents for these publishers. They have to make a profit. And there's a lot of interest right now. And in fact, since Trump was elected, there's been extra attention uh, to get more Muslim voices published. There's agents who are specifically asking for Muslim writers to contact them and submit their work. I and mean, it's almost part of this resistance that you know, we need our voices out there, but we have to give them content, but we also need to support the books that are out there. So I think whatever you can do, not, not just mine, but Muslim books that are mainstream published, the ones that, um, you know, Muslim presses are amazing, we need them, we need those books to teach our kids how to practice their faith, um, but the books that are out there for anyone to consume, the ones that you find in the libraries, um, you know, we need to support those books. and. Donate them if we can, you know, get them for your kids' friends who aren't Muslim too, for your teachers, uh, for, for the classroom. Uh, I think it's, if you can write reviews, that's huge. Publishers read reviews that people leave um, and on Amazon and elsewhere. And of course, read to your kids, spend time reading with your kids and, and get their feedback on, you know, what they think about these stories and what it means to them because um, they're lucky to have them, really, compared to to where they were years ago. So with that, I'll stop. Please stay in touch and you can connect with me on social media. But I'd love to hear your thoughts um, on anything or any questions about anybody that said. Sure. Uh, just a quick question. Where we can get the books from that website? Or do you, can we get it like from um, any other website? Yeah. Like so, um, no, this website is just to connect with me. So if you're interested in knowing, um, you know, about my, what I'm working on or, you know, things like that, that's where you can first get in touch with me, that's how. Um, but my books are available in bookstores um, and also on all the online retailers like Amazon or Barnes & Noble, places like that. I always try to encourage people to support independent booksellers if possible, but I know it's hard, so, you know, any, anywhere, you know, inshallah. Um, Jazakallah for all the work that you do. I have a couple of daughters who are um, who I think are budding writers, but how to keep them inspired when they get older? To keep writing? Mm -hmm. So I think it's amazing to hear about young writers, and I, like I mentioned in the beginning, oh, I'm sorry, I was talking kind of adult level, but when I when I was little, I loved to write, and I wrote, like I mentioned, poems and plays and that, the family newspaper that I showed you, so I think um, writing when you're young, you never know. You know, you develop that love for writing when you're young, you keep doing it. Um, I think sometimes when you're in school, like those school ages, you find, especially upper middle school, high school, it's kind of hard to keep kids reading. That's when they, they have so much schoolwork and it's hard to read for pleasure. But um, I think if you develop that passion when, when kids are young, they pick it up again later. Um, and really try to find opportunities. There's like great writing contests for kids. Um, to enter into, I think that's a nice way to motivate them. Essay contests or poetry contests. Um, you know, sharing work with even family and friends is a way to keep them encouraged. Like, you know, email a story that your kids written and, and get some feedback from friends and family and encouragement. Um, things like that, I think, are important. And then um, mother daughter book club is another fun thing, or even a writing group for kids um, would be a nice way to keep keep motivated. Shall I keep writing? We need more representation. That's great. Any questions? Um, yeah, so uh, I was curious, you know, you mentioned that you were born and raised here. Um, at the time that you were growing up and the kids now um, that are growing up, you know, 10 years old and stuff, have they, do you see a change in, in them in terms of an identity? Um, of being Muslim, is there a difference between then and now? Um, are they more open about it, or are they more conservative about conservative about their faith and uh, and character? It, it depends, you know, on many factors. I, looking at my own situation, um, as I mentioned, when I when I grew up, it wasn't even that I was, um, you know, hiding it. You know, it was just that nobody really knew what being Muslim was um, outside of the community. So when I was the only Muslim in my class, I had no no peers to share that experience with or anything. And, and the little I mentioned that Amna's best friend is a Korean American. I had a Korean American best friend as well because she was 
another minority who I could, you know, we could relate to on, on different levels of having Asian parents even was the only thing we had in common. Uh, I think it's different now from, I live in the same area that I was raised in now, and I have two kids who are now 12 and 16, and two boys, and, and looking at them, I see, I do see a big difference that even just in terms of their peers, my, my son, when he was in second grade, had three other Muslim boys in his class, which was huge, you know, I couldn't imagine that when I was growing up, and, you know, the teacher had, we went in and read my book during Ramadan, and, you know, that was something that never would have happened when I was a kid. Um, I do ask my kids, I think having grown up here, I'm very aware of what they're feeling, what they're thinking, and do they feel different, and, and I don't think they're as connected to Pakistani culture as I was growing up, obviously having immigrant parents, but I feel like they're more secure in their Muslim identity. Um, and for me, that was something that is very important to me in this book, too, to, to write it from the perspective of a child who's not embarrassed or ashamed of who she is, because I feel like there's a lot of diversity stories where there's a first or second generation uh, American child from a, you know who's immigrated or either or born to children of parents of who have parents who are immigrants and there's that oh my my parents speak with an accent or they cook find there's funny food in my lunchbox or you know that I think that story's been done and I really wanted to write a character who was unapologetically Muslim and <laughs> And of course, like embarrassing things happen, like going to school smelling like masala. I mean, that happens, and no one likes it. But you know, at her essence, she's proud of who she is, um, and it's not either an issue. It's really other things like friends and family, and etc. And I think for me, maybe I drew on my own from my own kids and the kids that I know who are a bit more like that. You know, a lot they seem more more balanced and. Um, and our communities are more established too. Like we didn't have centers like this when I was growing up. We used to rent a, a high school. Um, so I think I think it's progress. I hope it's progress in the right direction. Even though, unfortunately, our kids are facing challenges that we, we didn't have to face. So I think they're more equipped to deal with them. I'm doing a project. Islamophobia for school, and I, I, I got some things of preventions. But what, what do you think you can prevent from from Islamophobia spreading? How do we prevent it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think um, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I definitely think getting our stories out, like I mentioned, is one way to humanize Muslims. I think when people don't know us and as people, you know, as community members and friends, and only think of what they hear in the news and believe what they hear, you know, then it's all ISIS, right, or all terrorism, and they, they start to equate that with Muslims. Um, I think it's important for people to also see stories from all different types of Muslims and realize the diversity that's out there, because that's another thing that people just don't see. They don't realize that the largest group of Muslims in America are African American. Um, or that the largest immigrant community is Pakistani American, and that Arabs are a smaller minority, you know, minority of of, uh, of Muslims in America. But that's what everybody thinks that all Muslims are speaking Arabic and are from the Middle East. Um, so I think having stories of all types, you know, more African American representation. Um, I think obviously that's my you know what I do so this is what I can think of in terms of other things and I think I think we need more mainstream Muslims in the media just um, obviously in the news itself but even uh, in pop culture I think having more characters and I think it's starting to happen you see um, more Muslim random characters in TV shows or movies um, that's one positive thing and even you know there's it's exciting to see commercials with people wearing a job in it and I think the more we can do to just normalize um, and, and show that we're part of society. Um, and then of course, each of us are ambassadors, really. I think being active in our communities, being, um, you know, in running for office, I think is huge. Those of us who could stomach it. <laughs> but, um, you know, being in your, your child's PTA, you know, being active in interfaith, but also <coughs> other, uh, whatever you can do to be out there so that people know that. You're Muslim, but you're many other things. I think it's really important. I hope, but yeah, the open house and the masjid, that that brings the local people also to see how and what happens in the masjid.
Yeah, absolutely. I think um, interfaith and welcoming people, and uh, you know, and, and just from a personal perspective, I think also allying ourselves. I think personally, you know, even me, from, you know, seeing the way librarians and educators have championed this book and, and other books of mine. Um, this book, I think, because it's um, the new imprint, Sloan Reads, I mean, it's, it's been beautiful to see the way people have stepped up and celebrated this, and non-Muslims I'm talking about. And I feel like um, we have so much support from our, you know, our other minority groups. Like, I was invited last week to a People of the Book Fair at a synagogue in D.C., and it was, it was so lovely that there was three Jewish authors and then they invited me to come. And um, I was invited to the National Cathedral where they had a chapel on Islam for their little kids at a school for up to third grade and they invited me. And I just, I think that we as a community, because for the first time we're being targeted the way we are, um, we have to come out of our shells and we have to also ally ourselves with other other marginalized communities like the Black Lives Matter movement and even LGBTQ, like we have, we can't discriminate um, and and think our rights are the ones that matter and it's okay for other rights to be trampled. I think we have we have to unify um, with the Jewish community, other other minority communities, and that way we can hopefully you know fight it, fight what's happening um, because they are our allies.